Next, we have um, Adam Gossick Wolf and Santosh Rohit on design controls. Hello. Uh, hey, everyone. Hey, guys. Can you share your slides or? Sure. You yep. can do that. Hopefully everyone can see that. And I, I understand there was a small technical glitch with Pierre's screen, but we will um, we'll be posting all the slides later. I'm not sure if you have Flux or something similar on Adam or Santosh. Can you see it? Can you see our screen? I think it should be fine for how we are presenting. Yep. No, that's fine. All right, awesome. A bit orange, but that's okay. <laughs> we don't know why. Yeah, it, uh, some of it's a bit of Zoom technical difficulties, but right. anyway. Okay. Yeah, well, right. thanks for uh, inviting us on here, Ben. Uh, just a little bit about ourselves. Um, I'm Adam Gossick Wolf. Um, I'm a medical device engineer. I've worked uh, class one and class two devices um, in Santosh. Uh, so I'm Santosh Rohit. Uh, so I have worked in medical devices for some time now. I'm more of a jack of all trades. And right now I'm also looking at uh, regulatory and quality affairs for my company. And I've mostly worked on class one, but I also worked on class two and some class three devices. So I think a lot has been talked about risk because that should be the criteria for how we design and how we make things work. And as Michelle and Pierre and everyone has talked about, the high risk kind of most of the times translates to higher classification, be it EU or FDA or anywhere, and which basically translates to much more stricter controls. And FDA, we follow 21 CFR 820. And as discussed briefly, I think most devices, I mean, whatever falls into class one, they are mostly exempt. But when they go into class two, they are mostly non-exempt from the requirements. But uh, and class three is going to be the special controls and PMA and everything comes into play. And with EU MDR, which is now which was supposed to have come into act last month, but uh, it's now postponed by a year now. Uh, it's the same. It's class one, class one reusable, measuring sterile, class two A, and so on. Uh, and we have the links for like different classification rules uh, at the bottom of the page, slide. And this is uh, from Emergo, which we work with a lot. And this, we don't spend a lot of time. Uh, some questions were asked about how much time does it take? This scenario is basically not an emergency or a pandemic situation. It's more of a general time, how much it takes. Uh, this is for the US market uh, and the ease of getting something to the market. Uh, and we can go to the next one. Sure. And this is mostly with Europe. And you can see that the classifications are class one. Uh, Self-certified is the easiest to get through. You don't need to uh, have a lot of uh, checks. You basically get through with an IFU and uh, everything. I think it's uh, you just go through a notification process where all you need to do is like get a, either you are already in EU or you have someone who is going to officially represent you on the EU market and you go through a notification process. For class 2A, and so on and coming up even for class one reusable class one sterile and measuring you will actually have to go through a notified body audit but when it's class one sterile or reusable you'll be going through a more of a micro audit compared to what you would going for a full fledged audit for class 2a 2b and class 3. and a lot was talked about peer, like peer was like mentioning how we need to have like a traceability matrix and risk plays into all of this, like starting from user needs to how we define specifications for design inputs and what we call as design outputs going back into how do we accept something as usable or not up to the point of transferring into production controls, seeing if we can actually transfer the design to what it needs to function, how it needs to be made, uh, then followed by the design change process where 
how do we process changes? How do we go through? How do we make sure like every change is accounted for? All of this, then we store it as a design history file and we're going to talk about design reviews as a tool. Okay, um, I'll take over uh, for a little bit. So this is kind of the flow chart of um, the design process. You can see pretty much after every step, there is a design review like uh, Santos just mentioned. Um, and at these reviews, um, you've got a chance to, to go back and uh, tweak things if uh, it doesn't pass um, the requirements you're looking for. So we'll just go into the details of these. Uh, so the first thing is defining your user needs. Um, so this is just uh, basically what does the um, healthcare provider, the surgeon, uh, whoever's gonna end up using this product, what do they need uh, for their device? And something to keep in mind is these aren't necessarily going to be uh, very specific or technical. Um, we came up with an example here of uh, an infrared thermometer. Um, you know, so this would be a user need for that. The doctor needs a patient contact free tool uh, that measures temperature at an office facility. Um, so then moving forward from that, you move on to your design inputs. And so these take your user needs and we translate them into um, engineering specifications that we can then use to design the device. Um, so following that same example from the thermometer, uh, we get more specific and say it must measure between uh, 90 degrees Fahrenheit to 105 degrees Fahrenheit with an accuracy of plus or minus one degrees. Uh, so you can take that now and actually use that to uh, design your device. And so Adam, direct can quickly go back yeah, go ahead, go So the user needs and design inputs also, uh, they're not just what the end user wants, but something to do with risk as we should like the regulatory risk has to be taken into consideration the risk of uh, how it would be manufactured on the fold that would be a risk that needs to be considered it could also be based on complaint data that we have like okay so we have had issues with uh, uh, the doctors dropping the thermometer for example like so we need to make it sturdy enough that that will translate to a design input and what would be required at the point of like what is the loading on the thermometer when it falls down and how do we need to design for that? That's just like one quick example. Adam, you can go ahead. Yeah, no, no, thanks. Those are all really great points about the design inputs. It's not necessarily what it needs to do, but also environmental and manufacturing, uh, all that kind of stuff. So you take those inputs and the design outputs <clears throat> are what you actually end up with. Uh, so these are the physical characteristics, uh, the actual design of the product. Uh, so if you're following that same train of thought with it must measure 90 Fahrenheit to 105 Fahrenheit, um, your design output is an infrared thermometer with an LED display. <clears throat> now, did you have anything you want to note on that, Santosh? So I think what we also need to understand is like every single user need can branch out into many design inputs and each design input might have some design outputs. So it does not, it's more like branching out, starting like what, like the surgeon wanted a device which can uh, extract a tooth, for example, starting from that one very basic need, uh, what design input does and design outputs do is basically trying to make sure that we understand the overall scope of how it's going to be applied, the intended use, the settings in which it is being used. Uh, and when we think about the settings in which something is being used, we also need to think about the risk factors. If we have a past history of what complaints that we have, what trending data that we have, the past studies would say uh, something needs that could be improved upon or what uh, some need that hasn't been met or something that needs to be taken care of. So all of these, I think, starting from user needs to design inputs, design outputs, all of them also go through a design review process or, or need to go through a design review process, more to say. And, okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, 
just to build on that, I think that's an important point to remember is after each of these stages, you go through a design review and, you know, check that everything is lining up as you're expecting and you've got a chance to go back and change things. Uh, so then we move on to verification and validation or VNV. Uh, they're a little bit different. So verification, you're basically checking the design outputs versus the design inputs. And verification you would do um, while you're designing and prototyping and before you actually get to any sort of manufacturing. Uh, validation testing um, basically is going back to the original user needs and checking with a production level part uh, so you actually have to use the same manufacturing processes that you would use to make it and compare those to the original user needs and check that, yes, it does actually meet uh, what the uh, user was looking for. So this is a little bit more of what I was saying. So when you get to validation, you hand it off to manufacturing and you actually build it in the exact same way you would uh, produce it during production and so that testing could be mechanical testing or it could be an actual clinical trial and get it into the, the hands of the uh, healthcare provider or surgeon whoever's using it so the uh, kind of validation testing and uh, verification testing that you do is also dependent on the risk uh, if it's a class one device with a lot of history most of the times you could get away with uh, laboratory testing trials like uh, as simple as uh, 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 tensile testing, or it would be as simple as a uh, validation would be like calling like three different skill sets, three surgeons or three end users with different skill sets and see if they could use it. But with the more, it, if something is in class two or class three, you it becomes more and more rigorous and you basically make sure like at the end of the day, like the end user should be able to use it. And especially with the production level that you need to have. And if you can't produce what you envision as a design, then remember that the final user will not be able to use it. So it's important to basically design products which can be manufactured and which can also be tested. Because you cannot test them, there is no way that you can know if it's working or if it's not working or if there are going to be some fault lines while you're using it. And that's the reason we need all of these validations. Um. You want to keep going on that? Uh, yeah. So design transfer is again like when we come up with the product as uh, we start with the user needs, we have design inputs, we come up with the design output, which is basically the result of the design process. And now we have a drawing. So now we need to transfer that to be able to be manufactured. And that's where design transfer comes into place. And at this point of time, any changes that you do, you have to make sure that it like, if it changes the form, fit, and function, basically that's like the rule of thumb, which I would, which is which could be called as a like significant change. If the end user, is, if the functionality changes, the performance of the instrument or device changes, or how uh, end user would use it would change, then you have to go through the validation process all through again. That's part of change control process too. And as Adam talked about, it's basically at this point of time you're making sure like you can manufacture it make sure all your methods of manufacturing are finalized. There's like nothing that you're going back to. And this is basically a handoff where, okay, we said design is done. Now we are going to start manufacturing parts. And this is that handoff. And when you do that handoff, make sure like PFEMA, which is basically uh, make sure the process, the risks in the process are taken care of, the risk, risk which are mitigated. And 14971, which was called out by Pierre, is a very good, uh, standard it's very easy to use it's very good and the especially the latest one which came out in 2019 december or november is a very good tool that you could use for all of this because any output that you get out of it if you have do not have a control in place which could be testing which could be kind of validation that you do you have to basically i think all that you do with verification validation is making sure that there are controls these are the controls which make sure that the device functions as intended at the location it needs to be used. And coming from engineering background, I think uh, 
especially if you're a mechanical engineer, you hate tracking design changes. It's what like engineers basically hate, like, oh, why do we need to go through the process? But the reason is we need to understand we are in the medical devices field and any change that we do has to be documented. It could be in the design review process or uh, most companies actually use the called engineering change notification or engineering change request process where before any change is done, it needs to go through a design review by a cross-functional team. And the cross-functional team could include someone from manufacturing, someone from quality, making sure like they can actually detect the change, they can make the changes because if there's any change that needs to be done to gauging, uh, if there needs a higher uh, percentage of parts that need to be uh, checked or inspected, uh, and if, they, they, if it's a significant change, then you had to also make sure like all the necessary documentation, which could be an IFU, uh, it could be a surgical tech guide that it needs to be used. Uh, and if sometimes it could also be a regulatory change where we need to go back and say, okay, if this change will have classify our device to class three. So we need to do the impact analysis and go back and like make all the changes that need to be done. This keeps everything in the loop. So if someone, we could be part of uh, a product or a company at some point of time, but a change control process basically makes sure that if some, if we do leave the company at this point of time, if someone else comes in and fills our position, they could still look at the documentation that we have and basically recreate the product without any issues. They should be able to understand the logic behind why a design is so and so and why some testing was done, why there are certain kind of controls and so on. And do you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, uh, I mean, I think that's all. I mean, the, one of the most important things is traceability and mm -hmm. keeping track of all your changes. Um, I don't know how many times I've gone back to something and say, oh, why did we do this? And having that documentation is not just helpful for uh, getting, uh, you know, certified with FDA and ISO, but you know, just for engineering, being able to understand why you made those changes so many months ago. And FDA design controls, I think if there are different forms of design history files that are required by EU or Australian TGA or Canada or all of the other regulatory bodies, but you need to at the very basic level need to have this whole set of documents which talk about what, what is the user need? How did you go from user need to actually making it, uh, having a final drawing of the part? And with this one, the design history file basically contains all the change history, all the design reviews, uh, how did it come to addition, how, what changes were made, and what it, those changes entail with respect to form, fit, and function, or if it's just a change in regulatory, or if it's change in how we're going to market the device. Uh, and if there is also a change because we have had a trending of complaints with respect to a, a design or a design feature, a design history file is basically that Bible that you can basically say, okay, I have this, this is what I need to do any new product or recreate the product that is already out in the market. So we have been talking about traceability and this is just like a, I mean, the easiest way to make sure that you have a traceability is use an Excel sheet, a spreadsheet where you have line items starting from user need, which can break down into different design inputs, which can, could be indexed. And the, the, each design input needs to be tied to a design output. And all of like each phase needs to go to a design review. So you need to have, you could ha basically have like a simple template, which covers all of this, starting from user need to design verification validation. And you could also, if you want, you could include uh, the risk man. I mean, more, I mean, it's. I would recommend that you also have the risk analysis that you have done, like it could be the DFEMA or the DFEMA documentation, and include that in this particular uh, spreadsheet. This is just uh, what we got from FDA, but you could create your own. The basic idea being, there needs to be a chain of. You should be able to recreate the logic why you're doing something and how you make sure like it, it is working or it works. So how do you validate that? Uh, yep. 
Adam, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I mean, if you look at this, uh, you said this earlier, but I think it's good to reiterate it is that a user need can branch off into multiple design inputs, which could be multiple design outputs. You can see the design input here um, has three different outputs. And so I think that's important to remember that um, all those outputs are there to meet those original user needs. So if you were to look, look at those, they would connect back to the, that original requirement. Okay, um, I think we've got some time for questions here. Were there any questions, Ben? Yes, there were. Um, so is there any difference between the initial engineering design and engineering change in terms of the records? If so, where is this line drawn? This is especially relevant to some of the teams that may not have kept you know, proper documentation or part of an open source team where it's sort mm -hmm. of been uh, less formal than you would have in an established company. Yep. So I think uh, what would be very helpful in that scenario is basically uh, being able to recreate the docs. I mean, you might have documentation just not in a single format or like a laid out working uh, template or something like that. But there's almost always a very likelihood that you actually have you 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 basically have the requirement and you have the testing. It's just not like tied to each other. What I would always do in such a scenario is go, go back to saying, okay, let me recreate a spreadsheet starting from user need to what I have as testing. While you do that, you, you can actually figure out what else is needed to complete that whole line of thought. And when you talk about change control, I think we could also, uh, we also can answer the question in a way how we define the design history file, when does a design history file file keeping start? So there's like the initial concept phase where you're just like tinkering around, you have one probably design in your head, and you're trying to figure out if it'll work or not, you could uh, uh, try to check if it's working, you might have three or four designs. Uh, all of that data could be used, it need not be part of the design or the document control what you need to have is like the final design when you have a design input it needs to be well defined it needs to be unambiguous and it need it should not be open to interpretation because once you have some a specific, uh, specification or input well defined you know what is what design output should come out of it or how testing should be done out of it like so when you actually are so by the time you have a design input it's part of the change process or when you have a user need which is taken care of and then you have, uh, you think you have, you're able to define the design input based on the user need and sign off the documents. That is part of like a sealed process. Like if you need to make any changes to that, you go back and go through a review process back again. And when you actually are going back to documents which are already finished or like which you have done in the past, always go back to a spreadsheet and see if you can complete the line of thought. And you could, if you miss something, fill that gap in and like uh, re-review the documents and sign them off at once. Yeah, okay. I want to add a little something to that too. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use uh, the design reviews as opportunities to uh, document uh, the changes you're going through and uh, the different um, designs that you've worked on in that uh, process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I know <clears throat> like a lot of the teams have sort of just been tinkering around and, and fiddling with things to get a sort of a version one or an alpha version built. So they may not have had, you know, all the formal process, uh, but if they can go back and document that and then maybe start a very formal process on, like you say, user needs and the inputs and outputs. Um, you know, at what point from, you know, if they've got a, say, a little device that may be working mm -hmm. in general, and then, you know, it's still probably a long ways from a, an end product. Um, if they haven't documented everything as well as they should have, uh, especially in open source, mm -hmm. um, 
is that okay or, or can they go back re retrospectively and, and that's okay as well? Yeah, they could go back because the way that I look at it is uh, if you do not, like when you're tinkering around, it's like it's, you're basically working with concepts. Mm. But if you like, if you cannot define or defend why you have certain design, that's a problem. Because at that point of time, you have something in hand, you know it is working, but you cannot define why it's working or how it's working. So you need to have the minimum documentation or like minimum knowledge to be able to recreate this document saying like, okay, this needs to withstand 500 pounds of force. That's why this is designed. Or this needs to be held by the hum it's like human factors are taken into consideration to design this handle. So it's thickness of three inches by uh, with a grip for thumb and so on. So, so I think that early on in the process, I would say like when you're trying to design something, uh, try to envision why you want to design it that way. And even if you have scrap notes, it doesn't matter. You can recreate this document once you get to that phase. The only time it would be very problematic is like, you don't do that. And you cannot like, before you hand off the project to some person, you don't actually document any of that stuff. Because at the end of the day, before you uh, sign off on the project, you need to be able to sign off all these reviews. And within the review, if it's not a robust review, basically it's okay, everyone is here, you all agree and we disperse and sign off the documents, that's a bad review because you're not actually going through if the device is designed as intended, if uh, the testing that has been planned, laid out takes care of that or the validation takes care of that, uh, or all the risks have been taken care of while designing the input and the product itself. Uh, so again, going back to like, make notes as much as possible, even if you're doing off an idea that you have in your head. Try to make sure like, if you're not able to go back to say like why you designed something, that's a problem. Always just like, even if it's like makes very little sense, put it down and maintain those notes. Yes, okay, great. Um, so you're talking about signing off. So the last question and then we'll go to the next speaker, but just talking about signing off um, on, on the design reviews. Mm -hmm. Particularly on an open source project, the volunteers um, might be quite transient, so they might mm -hmm. um, they might change. What what would be the best way to sort of manage the sign off process in in that manner? I would say I think uh, one. I think we should always try to have uh, the qualification of the persons or like the background, like a general uh, note of like what uh, where a person is coming from, what the background is like and what their role in the team is. So we have that roster and when we, we should still have reviews. It could be unofficial review, but the notes that you take, like everything, like have an agenda of like what you're reviewing, why you're reviewing and what could be the next phase of that particular idea. Uh, once you have like, uh, always think about how it could be used by the end user when you're having those meetings and have a few premeditated cushions on like, how can I make sure that the quality of the device is there? So let's say uh, you're having a meeting about brainstorming ideas. So the meeting should be able to at least have notes of the meeting saying that, okay, these are the people who have attended the call. Uh, these are the people who had these ideas and think they should go ahead with this one. And the reasons for that are A, B, and C. And or otherwise uh, there could be reasons why you would not want to try that idea. So it'll be, these are the reasons why we would not do that. Uh, it's always just good to take notes and make sure like you are able to go back to that. The best way to review that is like wait for a day and go back and read those notes and see if you could actually recreate what was discussed. If not, I would say have a re regroup and have it take it forward. Okay, great. Um, we probably don't have any time for any more questions. Um, I, just some of the ones that were asked what software workflows, tools, um, are you largely looking at spreadsheets or do you have a specific tool that you look at? Um, so we have, I mean, Adam and I, we have been using a lot of spreadsheets and it's very intuitive for us of how we use it. Um, a regular Excel or Google spreadsheet normally work for us. Yeah. Uh, Okay, and just quickly, um, are there any points that we need to know what to defend against 
So we know what to note in the design history file. I think you touched on a couple of these. Um, just because the speed of development can move so quickly, is there any particular areas you should focus on for FDA? Uh, FDA would always like to know uh, the design features, like, but as I said, like it could be an ergonomic feature why you design something, or it could be a uh, functional in the sense like uh, a scalpel needs to be able to cut into uh, cortical bone, for example. Or, I mean, it's normally used for cortical bone, but like a thick tissue. Hmm. So, what would be the energy? What would be the axial loading that particular instrument needs to withstand? So, those specifics were are like always really helpful and again tying it back to materials to manufacturing and having that risk mindset while doing all of that and trying to address risk as a part of those questions uh, I mean all, I would always say like the three ways I could look at risk is one uh, how will the end user use it what would be the like uh, ways it could be misused second how could it be uh, manufactured badly what would be those risk factors like it would be like edges or like rounded off cuts or some stuff like that and use i mean those two would take care of most of the things and the other one is like within review do we want uh, or like if they can be verified through any quality processes or not okay great um Okay, so I don't think we have any more time there, but thank you so much uh, for your time and your, your um, presentation. I think that was very useful to look at the overall process. And I think the takeaway message from these talks is document everything, mm -hmm. write everything you do down and make sure that you can always refer back to that and justify your design decisions to whoever's gonna be looking at that. Yep. Thank you, uh, Santosh and Adam. Um, Hopefully you guys will be available um, through Helpful Engineering Slack or through similar means to for anyone to contact you for any other questions. Um, Absolutely. Thank you so much. So Thank we you. do.